Sato is a lonely loser who is used to be a lazy high schooler who loved watching each anime and all day, hopefully. One day, he got magically summoned to another world as a servant, but instead of being powerful, he's treated like a doggy by a girl named Louise. The story begins with Louise preparing for her magic class at a school called Tristane Academy of Magic, which is similar to Harry Potter Academy. A new teacher plans to teach them a simple alchemy spell, and he asks Louise to demonstrate. However, her classmates are worried and behaving like Andrew Tate by saying girls cannot do the magic well, the teacher assures them that everything will be fine since it's just a basic spell, saying, what could possibly go wrong? On the other hand, the school's headmaster, Osmond, is always curious about Longville's abilities. He's relieved that the year has started smoothly, but his relief is short-lived when he hears a commotion caused by Louise, known for her troublemaking tendencies. Later, Louise is seen leaving the principal's office, and her classmates mock her for her consistent disruptions. Kirch, one of the students, antagonizes Louise and questions why she's not being punished. Louise deflects the blame onto the teacher for allowing her to use magic. Despite Louise's explanation, Kirch continues to tease her, mentioning the upcoming familiar summoning ceremony and eagerly anticipating Louise's inevitable failure. This angers Louise, who vows to summon the most powerful familiar of all in response. Later that night, Louise regrets her earlier boasts. The next morning, the students gather on the school grounds for the familiar spirit summoning exam, a significant ritual where students summon a servant to assist them in practicing magic. Despite her apprehension, Louise participates in the ritual. However, Kirch continues to taunt her, much to Louise's irritation. One by one, students successfully summon their familiars under Professor Jean Colbert's supervision. When it's Louise's turn, her incantation confuses her classmates, leading to a large explosion. Louise's familiar turns out to be a normal human boy, known as a pleen, who wakes up disoriented and unable to understand the language. Kirch and the class laugh at Louise for summoning what they consider a loser. Frustrated, Louise asks Professor Colbert for another chance, but she's informed that each mage can only summon a familiar once during the ritual. Left with no choice, Louise reluctantly accepts the boy as her familiar to avoid expulsion. In a desperate attempt to complete the ritual, Louise kisses the boy, causing runes to appear on his hand before he faints. Later that night, the familiar wakes up thinking everything was just a dream. However, he finds Louise next to him, reluctantly accepting him as her familiar spirit. He demands to be sent home, but stops when Louise begins to change her clothes. Annoyed, Louise throws her clothes at him. I know guys, what you are thinking but she tells him to wash them. Unable to understand, the familiar continues to make noise, prompting Louise to cast a silencing spell on him. However, the spell backfires, allowing the familiar to understand Louise's words but not silencing him. Conveniently, he learns about the world he's in from Louise. However, he finds it hard to believe that he's Louise's familiar, thinking he might have been taken by a cult. Seizing the opportunity, he runs away the moment Louise isn't looking. As he sneaks past Gitch and another first-year student with Kirch, sorry, I mean guys flirting, they notice him. The brief interaction with Gitch makes him think Gitch is creepy. Not wasting any time, he continues to escape. Louise soon arrives and demands Gitch's help to catch him. Kirch joins them with her date. Seeing him flee from Louise, Kirch can't help but laugh at her again. Gitch uses his magic to lift him into the air, and he notices the presence of two moons in the sky, making him realize he's no longer on Earth. He explains to Louise about his home planet, but she doesn't seem to care since he's her property now. She asks him to wash her clothes and basically be her servant. For the time being, he agrees to play along. The next day, Louise forces him to dress her by using food as a reward. They then go to have breakfast, and he gets excited when he sees a buffet, but it's only for the nobles. Disappointed, he has to eat on the floor. Louise tells him to be grateful because familiars usually aren't allowed to eat inside. After the meal, Louise suggests they spend time together since second-year students don't have classes. They go to the gardens, where Kirch continues to mock Louise for her familiar's attempts to escape, making Louise upset. He starts wandering around and acts accidentally bumps into a maid named Siesta, who is supposed to deliver a cake to Gitch. He sees this as an opportunity for revenge from last night and decides to deliver the cake himself. He starts causing trouble and exposes Gitch as a creep. Luckily, the girl from the previous night appears, looking for Gitch. He helps her find him, and it becomes evident that Gitch is seeing two girls at the same time. Margarita slaps him for being unfaithful, and everyone starts mocking him because he brought it upon himself. Kurt seeks revenge and challenges him to a duel. Louise tries to make her familiar apologize to Gitch because, as a pleen, he could never defeat a noble. However, he doesn't care and presents himself for the duel. Kirch summons a night golem to fight for him, and it delivers a blow that knocks him to the ground. Louise tries again to make him surrender, as he should see by now that he can't win, but he still doesn't care. Meanwhile, the teacher informs the principal about his marks, and the principal seems concerned, immediately requesting absolute discretion. 
Despite facing a beating, he refuses to give up. Despite all the adversity he faces in this world, he doesn't plan to kneel before anyone. Itch takes pity on him and summons a sword for him. As he picks up the sword, the mark on his hand starts glowing, and all pain disappears as he gains the main character's powers. He manages to defeat all the golems and even forces Gitch to surrender. Everyone is amazed, but he faints as soon as he releases the sword. Three days later, he wakes up to find Siesta ready to feed him. He's surprised to learn that Louise had been taking care of him all this time. He also finds her adorable while she's asleep, but he thinks it's a waste since he finds her personality terrible. As the days pass, he grows frustrated with being assigned Louise's laundry duties. He mentions Siesta's claim of looking after him without sleep, but Louise dismisses it, saying she's simply fulfilling her role as a master overseeing a familiar. During class, he joins Louise and learns about her nickname, Louise the Zero, from her classmate. He takes the opportunity to tease her about it, even composing a mocking song. This prompts Louise to withhold food from him that night. He protests due to hunger until Louise gives in. However, his comment on her flat chest causes Louise to kick him out of the room, and he ends up spending the night in the hallway. Luckily, Siesta discovers him and takes him to the kitchen for some leftovers, where the chef regards him as a point of pride for the commoners. After that, Siesta reveals to him that Louise had actually ordered expensive medicine for his recovery. Later, as he prepares to sleep in the hallway again, Kirch's familiar, a salamander, appears and drags him to her room where Kirch tries to seduce him. Just as she is about to kiss him, Louise arrives to interrupt. Louise pulls him back to her room by his ear and scolds him like a dog. However, he grabs her arm and teases her about being jealous. Louise says she doesn't mind who he's with as long as it's not Kirch. Later, he clarifies the incident with the salamander, prompting Louise to joke that it's embarrassing for him as a supposed sword wielder. He explains that the duel with Gitch was his first sword fight and his body moved on its own during the battle. The following day, Louise takes him to the town to buy a sword, with Kirch and Tabitha secretly following them. At the shop, the sword he really likes costs 3,000 gold coins, far beyond Louise's budget of 100 gold coins. Disheartened by the price, they settle for a cheaper, older sword, while Kirch decides to purchase the expensive sword for him as she has a crush on him. Later, Kirch and Louise present the swords to him, and he is caught in their argument once again. Amidst their trash talk, a voice unexpectedly interrupts them, telling the women to be quiet. Louise and Kirch direct their anger at him, but it turns out the voice came from the sword itself. The sword is revealed to be an intelligent sword, able to talk, and he is immediately drawn to it. Meanwhile, the sword introduces itself as Durflinger, who has been asleep for quite some time. Osmond receives a visit from Count Montmorency, a messenger from the royal palace, who warns the academy about an impending thief that night. While Sato is doing laundry, Siesta joins him to help, expressing her gratitude and newfound courage in his presence. On his way back to Louise's room, Sato is once again tempted by Kirch into her room where she offers him various items. When he refuses, Kirch tackles him to the ground. Louise arrives just in time and catches them in the act, dragging Sato away to scold him again. The following day, Louise has Sato wait among the other familiars while she attends class, feeling uncomfortable around the magical creatures. Eventually, he talks with the chef who provides him with food and informs him that Siesta has left the academy to work for Count Montmorency. Later, in Louise's room, the talking sword Durflinger suggests that Siesta may become Count Montmorency's mistress due to the circumstances. After acquiring directions to Count Montmorency's mansion from Gitch, Sato goes on a mission to rescue Siesta on his own. However, Count Montmorency proves resistant to the idea idea of letting Siesta go, sparking tension between Sato and Montmorency. Siesta intervenes, diffusing the situation and pleading with Montmorency for Sato's forgiveness. Montmorency reveals his interest in a specific book, the Zerp's family's heirloom, and proposes trading Siesta for it. Sato heads back to the academy and meets Louise, who takes him to her room. There, she tells him to forget about Siesta. Sato pretends to agree, but when Louise falls asleep, he sneaks into Kirch's room to take the book. Kirch asks Sato to go on a date with her in exchange for the book, which angers him. He takes the gold sword and rides off to Montmorency's mansion on horseback. Tabitha notices his departure and, with Kirch's help, they wake Louise to tell her that her familiar is missing. Sato is captured by guards at Count Montmorency's mansion and brought to see the Count. Despite attempting to fight with his sword, Sato can't use the special power he had when facing Gitch. The Count, wielding powerful water magic and ice arrows, easily overwhelms and attacks Sato. Just then, fortunately, Louise bursts into the room and blows up the ice arrows. She wants to take the blame, but before she can, Kirch steps up and gives the Count a really old magazine from 1975 as a way to apologize. Surprisingly, the Count is okay with this and lets Siesta go. Sato immediately figures out that the magazine was probably from his own world. Back at the school, Siesta is really thankful and gives Sato a kiss on the cheek. Sato wants to apologize to Louise, but she's already thinking of how to punish him. She's deciding between whipping him a hundred times or not 
not letting him eat until he almost dies. Some days later at the Tristane Academy of Magic, Louise is engaged in training for an upcoming familiar competition where the familiar has to perform an act to win the hearts of the audience. Louise decides that their act should involve Durflinger, although Sato's previous inability to wield the sword effectively makes him worry. Nevertheless, he tries to practice, resulting in failure. Later, Sato is still practicing when Siesta encounters him and discusses the upcoming competition, mentioning that even the princess of Tristane, Henrietta, will attend. The long-awaited day arrives, and the anticipation for the princess's arrival is palpable. Sato observes that Louise seems to blush as she watches. As the evening approaches, Sato remains at a loss for a performance idea and suggests that he should show off his laundry washing skill, which enraged Louise. Just in the nick of time, a knock on the door interrupts the situation, and a cloaked girl enters, who turns out to be Princess Henrietta herself. The princess hugs Louise, revealing their childhood friendship and the promise they made to support each other through tough times. Henrietta informs Louise that she used her influence to absolve them of blame in the Count Montmorency incident. Before leaving, she cheers Sato for the upcoming day. However, Sato's attempt to sound impressive frustrates Louise, leading to him getting beaten once again. The next day, all second-year students showcase their familiars, but Louise's introduction of Sato is nothing more than a laughing stock for the audience. Sato's attempt to restore their dignity backfires, embarrassing them further. As Louise drags him offstage, a shady green-haired woman in incognito mode targets the treasure room, but her golem is detected by Louise and Sato. While the golem is causing all the destruction, Sato pushes Louise out of harm's way but unfortunately gets captured by the woman. Louise, refusing to flee, casts a fireball that backfires, causing chaos. The misfire damages the treasure vault's wall, creating an opening. Seizing the opportunity, the mysterious woman commands her golem to exploit the crack and breach the vault. In the meantime, Tabitha won the competition with her dragon, Sid, flying up in the sky. However, they notice the ground shake when the golem hits the wall of the vault, causing it to crack. Sid and Tabitha hurried to the scene and see the woman escaping with the stolen Staff of Destruction. Luckily, Sid swooped down and saved Sato when the golem dropped him. However, the woman who stole the staff managed to get away. After everything settled down, Louise tried to apologize to Henrietta, but she says it wasn't Louise's fault and leaves. Louise then talked to Sato about the rumors going around the royal court. Sato wondered why Louise didn't run away when they were dealing with the golem, but Louise said that a mage who leaves their familiar behind isn't a true mage. The next day, the teachers are not conducting classes due to the robbery, and rumors circulate that the royal court is blaming the princess because the security was displaced due to her visit to the school. However, Louise and Tabitha are called since they had seen the bandit woman, and they want to confirm a drawing made by a villager. The principal gathers those willing to go hunt her down before she escapes. However, only Louise, Kirch, and Tabitha accept the mission, and Longville accompanies them as a guide. Sato wonders why a noble is stealing, but it turns out that some nobles renounce their status for various reasons, just like the secretary Longville, who is not considered a noble despite using magic. As they travel, Kirch clings to Sato to use his sword, and upon seeing that Louise doesn't mind, he reluctantly agrees. However, Louise is only portraying a typical Tsundur anime girl and is actually angry. They arrive at the cabin where the bandit was supposedly seen but find no one. The secretary goes to check the surroundings, but Tabitha finds the destroyed staff they stole. Before confirming if it's inside its box, they are attacked by a golem. Neither Tabitha's wind magic nor Kirch's fire magic work, so Louise tries to use her magic, but it also fails. The golem almost kills Louise if not for Sato saving her. Louise refuses to back down, insisting that she is a noble and nobles never retreat. Sato slaps her for being too stubborn, explaining that such things don't matter if she ends up dead. Louise starts crying, realizing that people will continue to make fun of her as always. Sato lifts her onto Tabitha's dragon and decides to fight the golem himself using the sword given by Kirch. However, it breaks on the first attack. Durflinger tells him to use it so that he can win, and when he uses it, Sato's main character powers activate, allowing him to cut the golem. However, the golem regenerates, so victory again seems far away. Louise takes out the destruction staff and tries to use it to defeat the golem, but it doesn't work as it's a grenade launcher. Sato realizes this and rushes like a COD player to throw a bomb at the golem. They know the bandit must be nearby because of the golem. The secretary reveals that she has always been the bandit and left the staff for someone to teach her how to use it. She knows about the mark on Sato's hand, so she tries to kill him with the staff, but it only has one shot. Fortunately, Sato manages to knock her out. Later, the principal and the royal court congratulate them and reward them for capturing the culprit, but only the nobles receive recognition. Sato agrees to this but asks in return to be told about the staff. It turns out that when the director was young, he met a man who used the staff to save his life, but the man died from his injuries. The professor is surprised as they hadn't imagined that Sato and the staff came from another world, but he is more shocked because he thought he would get a clue to return to his world. 
Later at night, a celebration commences, and Louise makes a grand Cinderella-like entrance. Everyone tries to court Louise, but she wants to dance with Sato, so she politely asks him for the first and only time, and they start dancing. Louise confirms that Sato wants to return to his world, so she becomes sad but thanks him for saving her. However, he uses the same technique as Louise, saying he did it only because it's his responsibility as her familiar. The next day, Louise continues to struggle as she ends up shouting and hitting all the customers. Scarin sends her to observe her colleagues from the corner. Meanwhile, Sato continues talking to a girl named Jessica in the kitchen, who is Scar's daughter. But when Louise sees him so happy, she throws a bottle at him, knocking him unconscious. Jessica takes him to her room and starts interrogating him, as Louise doesn't seem like a pauper. She suspects they are on some kind of mission and tries to extract information by offering to do various things to him. However, Louise suddenly appears and puts Sato to sleep again with a kick. Jessica starts annoying Louise, saying she should be working since she can't even earn good tips. Louise gets heated and says that if she puts her mind to it, she'll be the best of all and win the prize. Nevertheless, Louise remains in the corner, and on the last day of the week, the duo hasn't made any progress. Then, the city's tax collector arrives and kicks everyone out of the tavern to have it to himself. It turns out that no one messes with him since he charges huge taxes to those he dislikes. But Louise only sees that he's a noble and tries to improve her tip ranking by using him. The tax collector mistakes her for a boy due to her lack of talents, but he still wants to verify how small they are. Louise hits him, and the angry tax collector tries to attack her. Sato steps in to defend her, but since he forgot his sword, Louise has no choice but to blast them away with her explosion. The tax collector thinks she's a ruined noble and still tries to attack her, but when she shows him her royal certificate, he regrets messing with her and flees, leaving a pile of tips behind. Louise wins thanks to this, but they still have to leave because their secret has been discovered. However, Louise still wants to try on the prize dress, even if she only shows it to Sato, making him blush. On another note, the bandit is rescued by someone who seems to have known her for a long time. Both Sato and Louise return to the school, but Sato notices that it's empty because of summer vacation and many students have gone home. They see Kurt and Tabitha leaving for Tabitha's house, and since Sato is very friendly with him, Louise becomes annoyed and leaves him with a pile of work. Sato realizes that some things never change as Kirch continues with his sincerely apology to Montmorency Mori for his cheating. However, he notices a giant pot being thrown away and comes up with a great idea to use it as a washing basin. Meanwhile, near Tabitha's house, there was a flood, so they have to take another route. Kirch notices logos of the royal family from another country and confirms that Tabitha is of royalty. When they arrive at Tabitha's house, she leaves Louise waiting while she goes to see her family. The butler apologizes to Kirch but is surprised to hear that Miss Charlotte goes by the name Tabitha at school. He then tells her the story of Tabitha and Charlotte's family, the Orleans family. Currently, her uncle is the king, but her father was supposed to be the next king of Galia as he was much more talented. However, there was a succession battle, and her father died in that battle. Some nobles wanted to get rid of Tabitha as well, but her mother realized the threat against her daughter and sacrificed herself, going insane due to a spell. Tabitha treasures the doll her mother gave her and now believes it is her daughter. As a result, Tabitha became cold and reserved. Later, she was sent on numerous impossible tasks, but because Tabitha had exceptional talent, she managed to overcome all the challenges imposed on her to protect her family. Instead of allowing her to live a peaceful life, they only granted her a noble title and banished her from the country. Kirch can relate to her story as she was also expelled from her country. Back at the school, Montmorency prepares a potion to get revenge on Gitch. Meanwhile, Sato turns the giant pot into a bathtub and relaxes as if he were at home. Siesta passes by and is surprised to see him, but since her clothes got dirty, she decides to enter the bath. This makes Sato nervous, but she seems to trust him, so she doesn't mind entering. Sato starts talking about his world, but Siesta thinks he's joking, as a place with only one moon and no mages sounds very strange. Meanwhile, Montmorency keeps trying to give a potion to Gitch. Louise goes out to see why Sato is taking so long and is surprised to find him taking a bath with Siesta. Siesta remembers her great-grandfather through the story Sato tells, as he also claimed to have fallen from the sky out of nowhere. As she goes back to work, she makes it clear that what she liked most about the shower was Sato, causing him to blush. Louise is very angry but doesn't know why. She goes to the table where Gitch is and drinks his beverage, which had been enchanted by Montmorency. Later, when Sato returns to the room, he finds Louise drunk and starts a jealous scene, making her cry. Montmorency clarifies the situation. On the other hand, Tabitha has been assigned another dangerous mission, which is why she had to return to her house. Kirch decides to help her, and when she learns that Tabitha has nightmares, she lies down next to her to provide comfort. Due to a potion mishap, Louise becomes possessive of Sato, fearing he'll 
see other girls. She lets him go do laundry but pleads for his swift return due to loneliness. Montmorency explains the potion's uncertain duration. When Siesta sees Louise clinging to Sado, it triggers Louise's jealousy. Sado tries to explain but fails. He confesses about the potion to Siesta, but she doubts him. Returning to Louise's room, he finds her awaiting him in a nightgown, making Sado uncomfortable. He rushes to consult Montmorency and Gitch, who claim that they need the spirit's tears to undo the potion. Sado then convinces her to accompany him there for a solution. The following day, the group reaches a town submerged by the lake. The water spirit initially rejects Montmorency's plea, but Sado's sincere request changes her mind and reveals ongoing attacks on her. Sado vows to repel the attackers in exchange for her tears. At night, they hide in the forest, spotting two cloaked figures near the water. Sado prepares to attack alone, but Gitch suggests a coordinated approach. Sado's surprise assault and Gitch's magic fail against the opponents, even with Sado's activated mark. However, Louise intervenes, unleashing her explosive magic, which uncloaks the figures, revealing Kirch and Tabitha as the unexpected assailants. Recognizing each other, both parties share their motives. Kirch and Tabitha claim that they are targeting the water spirit under Tabitha's family orders. Sado suggests Montmorency call the spirit again to learn why the flooding occurs. The spirit reveals its anger over the theft of the Ring of Inari by Cromwell, making Sado vow to retrieve it and earn its trust. The spirit provides the drops of tears to revert Louise's state. Despite the potion's effects vanishing, Louise's anger towards Sado increases. Their confrontation is interrupted by Henrietta floating through the window. In another place, Longville and an associate meet someone identifying him as Lord Cromwell. The princess wants to assign them a secret mission since she's going to marry the Prince of Germania, and they need to ally with a militarily strong country to ensure the success of the alliance. They must prevent the contents of a sent letter from becoming public. Therefore, they are sent to the Kingdom of Albion to retrieve the letter. Gitch overhears the conversation, and as his father is a general, the princess also accepts his help. Dado keeps acting like a servant when Siesta shows up and apologizes for not believing him about the potion. However, Sado is curious about the name Gundolf since he has heard it twice. He visits the master to learn more about Gundolf, who is the familiar of a legendary mage. They speculate that they might be the second coming of them, but Sado doubts it as Louise is far from being legendary. Louise doesn't feel confident since she has trouble using magic correctly, but Sado tells her he'll keep her safe, which makes her blush. The following day, they wait for the bodyguard the princess sent with them. However, suddenly Gitch's familiar attacks Louise because of the ring given to her by the princess. Fortunately, the familiar learns its lesson when someone named Wards arrives and quickly dismisses the familiar to rescue Louise. Wards is the captain of the Griffin Squadron and Louise's fiancé. Wards takes her on as Griffin for the journey, while Sado seems a bit jealous as Louise blushes whenever she talks to Wards. They arrive in the city where they will board the ship to Albion and rest in a hotel for a day. However, Sado doesn't like Wards, which upsets Louise. She explains that the marriage was planned by their parents, but she still admires Wards. This makes Sado question if his presence was really necessary, further annoying Louise. During dinner, Wards learns about Sado being her familiar and becomes interested in him. He challenges Sado to a duel. Wards takes Louise to her room because he wants to tell her something, leaving Sado in the same room as Gitch, who has to attend to a lady he found attractive. Poor Sado is left alone, so he takes the opportunity to ask Durflinger if he knows about Gundolf, and Durflinger confirms that he has awakened Gundolf because he was Gitch's companion for 6,000 years. Meanwhile, Wards recalls Louise's past, where she used to cry and he would comfort her. He always felt a unique power in her, which is why he wants to marry her and become a noble with national and international influence. However, when Wards is about to kiss her, Louise thinks of Sado, and Wards resolves to win her heart. Sado discovers that his mark gives him the power to use any weapon created for that purpose. That's why the golden sword didn't work, since it was decorative. However, the strength of the weapon still depends on him, so he can't guarantee that he will defeat Wards. The next day, their duel begins, and Sado attacks with all his strength. Wards admits that Sado is quite fast, but his technique is poor with many openings, and he barely uses magic. Sado is easily defeated by Wards, and he hurries to say that this is proof that he wouldn't be able to protect Louise from a real mage. Sado is so upset that sometime later he seems to be crying when Louise finds him, but he excuses himself by saying that he was just reminiscing about his world. This annoys Louise, but it's evident that she is also affected by his loss to Wards. After not being able to communicate sincerely with him, she ends up telling him that she will marry Wards after completing the mission. Sado looks depressed, 
but then the bandit arrives and attacks them with her giant golem, allowing wards to take Louise by telling her that Sato and Gitch have returned home. To make matters worse, they just had an argument, so Louise believes the lie and goes to the port to board the ship. Sato and Gitch struggle to defeat the golem, but Kurt and Tabitha arrive following them, since they found wards attractive, and the bandit is forced to retreat after causing a commotion. Sato learns that the ship has already sailed, so he shouts Louise's name with all his strength, and she manages to hear it, although she thinks it's her imagination. Wards becomes jealous because Louise is thinking about Sato, but she denies it. To prove that she's telling the truth, she accepts Ward's marriage proposal, although she still has doubts. Meanwhile, Sato and the others have to wait until the next day for another ship. However, Gitch's familiar catches up with them. The following day, they arrive at the place where the Prince of Albion is hiding. At first, they doubt that the princess really sent them, but when they see the princess's ring, they confirm that she did indeed send them. The prince reads the princess's message and hands the letter to Louise. However, he has no intention of leaving his people, as this is not an ordinary civil war, an organization is behind everything. Now that he knows who he's fighting against, he will stay to defend his kingdom, even if it costs him his life. On their way out, Wards waits for Louise to ask the prince for their marriage. However, Louise thinks it's too soon, but Wards forces her and reveals that it is necessary for Reconquista. Louise realizes that Wards is not on the side of the good guys, but then Cromwell hypnotizes her, calling her a descendant of the Void. They proceed with the wedding while she's under hypnosis. However, before she accepts marrying wards, Sato enters the church like every romantic movie hero does, and Gitch's familiar recognizes the scent of Louise's ring. She breaks free from the hypnosis, trying to warn the prince, but Wards intervenes before the prince gives his ring to Louise. Sato is angry at Wards for being a traitor. Wards dismisses them all but decides to kill Louise since if she can't be his, she can't be anyone else. He sets the church on fire and leaves. Louise tries to chase after him, but Sato stops her, and they are barely saved by Tabitha and Kirch, who levitate them to safety with her dragon. Louise is unconscious and dreams about Wards in the past, becoming deeply saddened while slowly waking up. Wards starts to vanish, and in his place, Sato appears. When Louise is completely awake, she notices that she and Sato are kissing. Initially, she finds it surprising but closes her eyes while they both continue on Tabitha's dragon. The next day, Louise apologizes to the princess for failing to protect the prince and losing the letter. However, what matters to her most is that the prince entrusted her with his ring and his final words, so she holds no grudges. Back at the school, the professor goes on an expedition, believing he has found an ancient dragon. Louise makes her mission report to the director and also asks about the descendants of the Void since they called her by that name. The director tells her about the legendary element and the familiar called Gundolf. Louise can't believe that Sato is someone so powerful. However, she now feels embarrassed when he sees her because Sato acts normal even though they have kissed. Suddenly, her skirt falls down, and she starts asking him why they're not fitting right. What do you think guys why they are not fitting? Tell me in the comments. Sato thinks maybe he scrubbed them too hard when he cleaned them. This mix-up makes her so mad she kicks him out. However, he's actually glad to leave since she's been pretty mean to him. Siesta notices that Sato is lost in thought, so she sits down to talk with him. Sato takes the opportunity to ask her about her great-grandfather who came from another world. It turns out he arrived riding a dragon, and the dragon is still preserved as a relic. Sato immediately asks Siesta to take him to that village to investigate, but Kirch overhears the conversation and becomes interested in the relic, deciding to follow them. Louise feels bad for treating him poorly, but her mood worsens when she realizes that Sato is heading to Siesta's house. She recognizes the name of the village since it's the same place her professor was going to visit. Sato arrives at the village, and Siesta finds out where the treasure is located alone so her family won't misinterpret things. They head to the cave, but they are interrupted by their friends who follow them. As they enter the cave and go deeper inside, Kurtz becomes scared. The situation takes a turn for the worst when they discover someone else inside the cave. However, it turns out to be their professor who was with them. The professor explains why he is there, and they realize that they're all searching for the same thing, the dragon's mantle. They reach a chamber, and there is a tomb with Japanese inscriptions. Sato confirms that Siesta's great-grandfather was also transported from his world. When they see the dragon plumage, it turns out to be a warplane that reacts to Sato's mark. The professor theorizes that there were two dragons, but one disappeared during the eclipse. If Sato goes with this dragon during the eclipse, he should be able to return to his world. However, this saddens Louise as he will be leaving her side. 
Meanwhile, the princess apologizes to her mother for sending that letter, but her mother is not angry since even though Germania withdrew the marriage proposal, she is the one who lost her beloved. However, they received some very bad news. Back at the school, they need fuel for the plane. Sato remembers that the professor had the dragon's blood, which is actually gasoline. They will have to reproduce it in large quantities to fly the plane. After a while, Sato also realizes that by riding the plane, he learns to control it. Now they just have to wait for an eclipse to be able to return home. Louise is upset, so she starts acting harsh. Suddenly, Gitch arrives with bad news, Albion changed its name to Reconquista and declared war on Tristan. In the meantime, Cromwell, now the newly declared emperor, gathers his followers and flexes the power of the Ring of Invari. He reveals his grand plan to conquer the entire continent, beginning with the colonization of Tristan. Cornwall aims to execute this scheme during the upcoming solar eclipse, which is mere three days away. Sato informs Louise of his impending departure in three days, aiming to return home during the solar eclipse, but Louise appears indifferent, infuriating Sato. He waits for her return from a meeting where Osmond announces the war's inevitability, leading to the Academy's closure. Henrietta forms a military force recruiting Academy boys and suggests that she will lead the front lines elsewhere. Later, Louise finds Sato asleep, bidding him farewell. Meanwhile, instead of heading directly for the eclipse, Sato eliminates Albion's Dragon Knights, who can't match his plane's speed. Sato exhausts his ammo and confronts wards on a wind dragon. On the other hand, Tabitha and Kurtz defeat the bandit, allowing Sato to engage wards alone. Louise witnesses their mid-air battle, while Kurtz, Tabitha, and Louise approach Sato guided by Tabitha's magic. Louise leaps from Sylphid to Sato's plane and finally confronts him about her feelings for him. Louise unlocks her void magic, casting the powerful explosion spell that annihilates Albion's aerial force, including wards. But the eclipse also ends. After the eclipse ends, the plane is nearly destroyed, and Cromwell tries to control Kirch and Tabitha with the Ring of Invari but is thwarted by Gitch. At the wreckage, Sato and Louise argue about his firing but end up kissing, renewing their contract. After the battle, Louise, Tabitha, Kirch, and Gitch receive medals from the princess. Louise eagerly searches for Sato to show him her medal but can't find him. Kirch is surrounded by admirers, Tabitha reclaims the Ring of Invari, and Montmorency and Gitch quarrel as usual. Meanwhile, Louise discovers Sato conversing with Siesta and punishes him. Sato is having a nightmare in which he travels back to his world, but Louise doesn't accompany him. He feels that nothing makes sense and wakes up as he falls off the bed. He then hugs Louise, feeling happy that they haven't separated. Louise can't let her guard down, so she pushes him away and tells him that his gratitude for forsaking her means he can sleep beside her and she won't treat him like a dog anymore. However, in return, he can't see other girls. Deerflinger says that despite all, they're getting along pretty well, but wonders how long it's going to last. After the opening, they get to the capital where the princess has to be crowned as the people want their new queen to lead them in the war against Albion. Meanwhile, a mysterious woman visits Cromwell and tells him she managed to steal the water spirit's ring during the ceremony, and then silence Cromwell forever. Back at the academy, Louise gives Sato a pair of glasses, and he reluctantly puts them on. He goes out and sees Siesta, so he goes to greet her, but his gaze falls upon her treasures, and the glasses start beeping. These glasses beep whenever he looks at someone with creepy thoughts, so Louise explodes in anger. She takes him away, considering him unfaithful, but every time a girl passes by, the glasses keep beeping, and Louise ends up causing endless explosions. Meanwhile, as the princess passes by on the street, Sato's gaze once again falls upon her, triggering the beeping of the glasses. Louise gets angry and explodes again. The royal guards mistake this for an attack and arrest them. Louise tries to see the princess to clear things up, but the queen is forbidden from doing so. Agnes, the leader of the musketeers, asks Louise to calm down as the queen is in a meeting with the academy director. Louise demands Sato's release, surprising them as they believe he was responsible for the attack. Meanwhile, Sato realizes that he's a plebeian, and it's going to be impossible for him to marry Louise. However, the queen appears, and he misinterprets her intentions, trying to kiss her. Agnes intervenes and attacks him but is stopped by the queen, who asks for Sato's help. They learn that it was thanks to them that the attack was repelled, and the queen offers Sato anything he desires as an incentive to keep helping her. It seems there are many enemies, and she cannot trust people that easily, besides, he is Gundolf's second coming. Meanwhile, Sato is eyeing the queen's talents, but Louise enters the cell, and Sato is scared, thinking she will hit him. Instead, Louise starts crying because they were separated, and she was worried. They return to the academy to await further instructions. The queen gives them a book containing void magic spells, but the book is literally empty, so they don't understand what to do. Agnes says her goodbyes and threatens Sato not to creepily see the queen again. Upon hearing this, Louise whips him all night long. However, the next day, Agnes rushes in and enters their bedroom, observing that Sato seems beaten up on the floor and Louise keeps whipping him. 
Agnes is embarrassed at the situation but insists that it's an emergency, the queen has been kidnapped. It turns out that while the queen was reminiscing about the promises she made with the Prince of Albion, she hears his voice and he appears at her window, telling her that the one they killed was a double. Sato decides to use the plane, which was being repaired by the professor, to catch up to the queen and they manage to take off just in time. But the professor is worried because some parts are missing. Sato quickly realizes that the plane is not functioning properly and starts emitting smoke, scaring Louise. On the other hand, the queen remembers when she first met the prince and wakes up. Meanwhile, the musketeers catch up to them, but the prince intervenes to prevent them from capturing them by force. He calms the queen, assuring her that everything he does is out of love, promising to explain later. But Tabitha follows them on her dragon and manages to keep them in the air using her wind magic. Sato spots the queen below, so he makes a forced landing in the water. Seeing Prince Albion, they can only assume it's because of the ring since it has the power to control the dead. They try to inform the princess, but the prince attempts to escape. Tabitha and Kurtz block his path. Louise demands that the prince return the queen, but the queen went with him willingly because she loves him and doesn't believe that he is a revived person being controlled. Tabitha realizes that talking is pointless and attacks directly. Although they leave him in a sorry state, he doesn't die and ends up defeating Tabitha and Kirch. Despite realizing that he is not the same prince she once knew, the queen still wants to go with him. Sado tries to attack them, so the queen starts using her magic, and the prince takes advantage of this to launch a combined attack that only some mages from royal families can perform. Sado can't absorb it and barely manages to stop it. Louise checks the spell book and finds a cancellation spell. Sato endures as best he can until she finishes casting it. When it's done, a lightning bolt strikes the prince, defeating him. In his final moments, the prince regains his freedom and apologizes for everything he has done. He asks the queen to forget him because a dead person cannot fulfill the oath of being with her forever. However, the prince assures her that he will always love her, and the queen breaks down in tears at seeing her beloved die once again. The next day, the kingdom decides to invade Albion, and all the men from the academy have to join the army. Sato is happy because he will be the only man left in the academy, but then a new exchange student named Julio arrives, and all the girls immediately fall in love with him. Sato feels disappointed as Julio becomes the center of attention, and nobody notices him. However, the classes are interrupted by the kingdom's orders, and they need to receive military training despite the professor's attempts to stop them. Montmorency refuses to practice with weapons since, as magicians, they should practice magic. However, Agnes easily defeats her, stating that they need to be prepared for anything. Thus, the training begins. All the girls try to challenge Julio, but he's only interested in Louise and tries to teach her how to use these defense weapons. Sato feels jealous about it, even though one of the musketeers offers him a wooden sword to train with. Sato struggles because he can only fight well with real weapons, and he ends up getting defeated. Agnes is shocked because she had seen him fight before, and he was better with a sword than her, but they clarify that his abilities only work with real weapons. Upon hearing this, Julio challenges Sato and says that he could use Durflinger if he wishes, and the reward would be a kiss from Louise. Louise gets upset because she doesn't understand how they ended up in this situation, but Sato accepts the challenge. However, Louise opposes it, fearing that if they fight seriously, Sato could get hurt or killed. She forbids him from using real weapons, so Sato agrees to fight with wooden swords. In the afternoon, he asks Agnes to train him with these swords as he realizes that his powers have certain weaknesses, and if he doesn't get strong on his own, he won't be able to protect Louis. Agnes agrees to train him, and she keeps beating him up, but Sato learns quickly as his body remembers all the experiences he had on the battlefield. However, he needs to go further as he can't see a way to win. Meanwhile, Louise has been looking everywhere for Sato, and Kirch tells her that she saw him with Agnes. Sato tries to create an opening by angering Agnes, and it works, so Agnes approves of him. However, they end up in a compromising position, and upon seeing them, Louise sends Sato flying and clapping him up all night. The next day, Sato is exhausted but still plans to attend the duel. The duel begins, and Sato performs quite well in Durflinger's eyes. However, Durflinger still doesn't see any possibility for Sato to win because Julio is a master of the sword. Sato is also surprised that a priest can wield a sword so well, so he tries to provoke him by saying that he was not expelled, or rather kicked out. However, this doesn't work on Julio. When Julio attacks, he ends up being the one defeated. Louise is happy and tries to give Sato the prize, but he refuses and leaves in frustration since Julio lost on purpose. Suddenly, the musketeer interrupts them as they are being called. It turns out that Julio is their companion, and he only wanted to test Sato's strength because they will form a team. The reason is that the Pope from Julio's country was concerned about the war with Albion and offered Julio's help to end it. 
Sato realizes that the Queen is gathering all her reliable forces in the Academy, which could affect them just as the Professor said. However, the Queen only wants them to lend their power to maintain peace. So Sato separates them, starting a fight with Louise for blushing at Julio's words. Meanwhile, an Albion, Sheffield, one of Cromwell's secretaries, blames the Kingdom of Tristan for his murder and triggers the people to oppose them and continue the war since she controls the high-ranking officials with the stolen ring. The next day, Sato wakes up and accidentally touches Louise's flat chessboard, causing her to start hitting him. However, her older sister, Eleanor, appears and takes her home along with Siesta. Louise gets annoyed every time Sato talks to Siesta, but her sister scolds her, as it's not proper for a lady. She keeps Louise in check during the journey in carriages, but a bump in the road makes Sato hug Siesta, causing explosive rage from Louise. After arriving at the gigantic mansion, dinner begins, and Leonor believes it makes no sense for Louise to continue attending the Magic Academy since she lacks talent. Louise tries to argue that she has changed and can now help the Queen with her missions, but nobody believes her. Eleanor wants Louise to get married as soon as possible, which leads them to discuss Eleanor's failed engagement, and their mother has to calm them down and postpone the conversation. Siesta ponders because Louise might have to get married, and Siesta starts to become determined to win him over. Meanwhile, Louise can't sleep, and her sister Catala suspects that it's because she needs to sleep with her beloved, assuming it's Sato. This makes Louise nervous, and she tries to deny it, but Catala realizes the truth. So, Louise goes to Sato's room. She sees someone in his bed, so she enters and kisses the person. But when she touches the person's talents and realizes they're soft, she discovers it's Siesta. She washes her hands, saying that it was Sato who called her to his room, leaving Louise shocked. Meanwhile, Sato was looking for Louise's room but gets confused and enters Agnes's room. She's having a dream where she reconciles with her ex-fiancé, so she hugs him. When Sato's hands touch her talents and realizes they're a little bigger, he realizes it's Agnes, and she gets angry. Sato attempts to justify himself, only to make it worse, and she hits him. At the same time, Louise ends up very hurt. The next day, Louise's father arrives, and due to the ongoing war, he sees no point in his daughter wasting time at the Magic Academy. He asks her to come back home and find a husband. However, Catalia tries to advocate for her as it's too sudden. Then their mother wonders if there's someone she likes, causing Louise to deny it, but she blushes like a tomato, making Alina and her mother imagine the worst. Louise runs off. Catalia visits Sato and tells him where Louise is hiding so that he can find her and escape together, as she knows their feelings for each other. Sato follows her advice, but Louise doesn't want to leave because she believes he is interested in Siesta. Sato starts saying all sorts of things, explaining that he is still with Louise despite her being selfish, flat-chested, and many other things because the only reason is that he loves her. He continues to tell her that he madly loves her. Louise doesn't believe him at first, but he swears it's true, so Louise lets Sato agree, and he kisses her with the intention to get very intimate. But the little boat on which they were navigating ends up at the shore, and they are caught in the act by the entire family. Louise's father's immediate reaction is to order to nerf Sato, so Sato unleashes his power and evades all the guards. He tells Louise's father that he doesn't need to worry while he leaves the palace with Louise. Catalia has helped them to escape as they sneak into the carriage with Siesta as the driver. While on their way back, Louise confirms once again that Sato didn't lie about loving her. Meanwhile, Siesta thinks that she is the only one that can make Sato truly happy and can beat Louise with her wrist. The following day, students continued with defense training, but thanks to their constant requests, they brought a wizard from the National Academy to help them, which is surprisingly leaner. It turns out that the queen found out that her father tried to imprison Louise, so she asked her sister to help. Leonor also reveals that she will be keeping an eye on Sato to ensure nothing funny happens. Catalia also appears and reveals to be an assistant because she doesn't want to leave Louise with Alina. So, Louise is now happy that both her sisters have come. In the evening, Sato has to unpack Louise's sister's bag, so Siesta offers to help her. She had never worn such delicate things before, so she tries one on for Sato to judge. However, Louise enters, and upon realizing that Siesta is there, she tries to shoot him away. But then an explosion is heard, and it turns out there was a robbery in the director's office. The musketeers handle the situation and ask everyone to go back to their rooms except for Sato. The director explains that they marked the thief, but she escaped. This thief was after the queen's rings, but the ones she took were fake, as the real ones were kept out of the country where they were safer. However, they conclude that there is a spot in the academy they split up to check everyone since the mark left by the director is not easy to remove. Sato has to check Louise's sisters, so he sneaks into Leonor's room and confirms she doesn't have anything. However, she wakes up and asks him for his last words, since she will forgive what he did after receiving a beating. Later, he goes to check Catalia, but before he can confirm anything, Louise enters and takes Sato away to punish him. 
However, before she can whip him, an explosion is heard, supposedly from the thief entering Catalia's room and using an explosion to escape. She ends up burning her talents, so they treat her burns, and Agnes finds it suspicious that she got burnt right where she should have the mark. They explain the situation, and Julio also suspects Catalia, which angers Louise as they did all this behind her back. However, the vice captain of the musketeers finds the rings in Catalia's luggage. So, supposedly the case is solved. Louise still doesn't believe it, but Alana appears and finds a hair at the scene. She uses a potion that will turn the hair to its owner, and it ends up on the vice captain's head. She denies being the thief, so Alana asks her to prove it by showing her talents. She tries to attack Agnes, but Sato stops her and manages to disarm her. The vice captain tries to escape using magic, but she's cornered by Catalia as a golem, and Agnes breaks her wand. Agnes interrogates her, and it turns out she holds resentment against the crown because her father was dismissed due to betrayal by the noble. Agnes went through a similar situation, but she doesn't believe that's the way to solve it. So, she asks her to confess who was giving her orders, and she only says it was a friend of her father. Agnes pieces together the puzzle as she was informed about her father's case and hypothesizes that this person called Ricky Mon was the one who betrayed her father. On the other hand, Louise makes it clear to Sato that she hasn't forgotten everything he did last night and ends up whipping him. Meanwhile, Agnes goes to Ricky Mon's house to inform him about the kidnapping of the queen and asks for authorization to search for her freely. He complies with everything she says, but Agnes asks him about the incident in her village, which was completely burned down. However, Ricky Mon changes the subject, stating that she shouldn't worry about things from the past when the queen is in trouble. Sato and the queen stay in a humble room, and she's freezing, so he has to share his warmth. But the guards come to inspect, and the queen has no choice but to pretend they are about to do something inappropriate to make the guards pass by without asking questions. Ricky Mon starts mobilizing his men, and Agnes follows him but runs into Louise, who is looking for Sato. She takes her along and overhears Ricky Mon planning to meet the Albion spy due to the queen's kidnapping. Louise can't help but scream upon hearing this, so Agnes has to cover up the situation with a kiss. Meanwhile, the queen explains to Sato that they faked the kidnapping to make Ricky make his move and catch him red-handed. On the other hand, Agnes explains everything in detail and heads to the theater, ordering Sato to stay. However, Scarin takes her with him as they have a play to perform at the theater. Louise meets Sato since the queen is now under Agnes's care. The play begins, and Ricky Mon was giving orders to the spy, but the queen overhears the conversation and accuses him of treason, attempting to arrest him. However, he is not defenseless and orders his men to kill the queen. A big fight ensues, and Sato jumps in to defend the queen. Ricky Mon decides to escape since this theater is his property and has several secret exits. But Agnes was already waiting for him there, as she wants to kill him for burning down her village without reason. Ricky manages to distract her with a lie and tries to burn her, but she emerges from the flames and impales him with her sword, ensuring he rots in hell, completing her revenge. On the other hand, Louise, as usual, interrogates Sato to find out what he was doing with the princess since she can smell her scent on him. He gets nervous, remembering everything that happened, but he turns the question back to her, and she's in the same situation. Nonetheless, she gets angry anyway, as a familiar should not doubt her mistress. The next day, they advise the queen to officially declare war, as otherwise the opposition groups could stage a coup and continue the war without any limits. She is forced to accept this recommendation. In the first week, everything seems to be going well, making Louise happy but not Sato, although his mood changes when he sees a sailor uniform. Meanwhile, Agnes is upset because the director refuses to open the lock of the underground library, as it is very old and could be dangerous. However, there are documents that record the attack on her hometown, so she asks for Julio and Sato's help to enter. Sato agrees, but Louise is not good with magic, so she cannot open any locks, which annoys her. Nevertheless, they need someone who can, so they ask for Leonor's help and head to the library. Siesta sees them and follows them since the entrance is through the women's bathroom, which seems strange to her. Leonor manages to open the door, but the professor finds them and tries to stop them. However, Agnes ignores him, and since the students are following her, she has no choice but to continue. They keep walking but hear someone coming from behind, and it turns out to be Siesta, who accidentally reveals that she gave the sailor uniform to herself because she has talents, unlike Louise. This angers Louise, and she casts a spell that causes a collapse. They can't go back, so they move forward. The professor finds Sato's world interesting, where there are no wars and young people can enjoy a peaceful life, but Agnes doesn't agree. She believes they should educate them to be willing to serve their country in war. The professor gets upset, thinking she only says that because she doesn't know war, even though he doesn't know it either. What Agnes experienced as a child was led by Rickian to gain a reputation for killing rebels who oppose the kingdom. The professor is concerned about Agnes because revenge is all she thinks about, and he believes that being so young, she should enjoy life more. 
but she doesn't care. They are at the library, and there's a warning that magic cannot be used, as it would result in everyone's death. However, Eiler doesn't believe such a thing exists, so they enter and start searching through the documents. Louise manages to find where the massacre was described, and Agnes begins investigating. Meanwhile, Siesta accidentally drops some books, and Eiler picks them up using magic, triggering the anti-theft spell that causes the library to collapse. Agnes refuses to leave without finding out the name of the captain, but to her misfortune, it's not written in that book. Agnes doesn't give up, but it's too late as a book hits her heel. The professor has to help her get out, and Agnes is grateful to him for saving her life. Agnes tells them what she read, and it seems that the captain who ordered the massacre is still alive. They took the page from the records because his name didn't appear, but they have to get out first to continue investigating. They remember that Louise caused a collapse, so they send Siesta to flirt with Sato so that Louise can open the way. Meanwhile, Mendel, who was involved in the massacre of Agnes's village, has now been assigned the mission to destroy the Magic Academy. Upon going back, they kidnap Louise and lock her up in a dungeon since she doesn't want Louise to depart with the Queen to fight on the front lines. Sato informs Eleanor about this to stop her. Louise feels betrayed, but Sato agrees that she shouldn't go, and even the professor doesn't think the academy students should witness the tragedies of the past, so he asks Agnes to reconsider her decision. At that moment, Menville arrives with his men to invade the academy, and since it's full of women, his men plan to do creepy things. However, Menville forbids it, stating that it doesn't matter if it's a man or a woman, they will die either way. The invasion begins, but Agnes and some musketeers defeat those who attempted to kidnap them. Meanwhile, Tabitha wakes Kirch after feeling trouble. The professor also notices something is happening and goes to investigate while Sato stays with Louise. It turns out that everyone has been kidnapped and gathered in the dining hall. Although the director and Louise's sisters offer themselves as hostages to free the others, Menvil refuses as they are all better hostages to make the queen reconsider her decision about the war. The musketeers surround the building and demand the release of the hostages while preparing for a surprise entry, but Menvil refuses and prematurely detonates the musketeers' bombs as he wants to start killing the hostages to prove he's serious. The musketeers intervene, but he melts their weapons with his fire magic. Meanwhile, the professor sends a distress letter and Sato frees Louise to join the battle. Upon returning to Agnes, she plans not to lose against someone who needs hostages, but Menville dislikes the idea as his style is to burn everything, just like he did with her village. Agnes gets angry upon hearing this, but Menville melts her sword, rendering her powerless. Meanwhile, Sato encounters Kirch and Tabitha, who want to help the hostages. However, the professor tries to stop them as they are facing professionals and could lose their lives. Kurtz refuses to run away as she hates cowards. Agnes asks Menville if he was the captain of the squad back then, but she's surprised to hear that he wasn't because there was a man nicknamed the Fire Serpent who had even more destructive power than Menville. He claims that the scar on his face was made by that man and he is also looking for him to get revenge. The professor agrees to help the hostages but will do so with a carefully planned strategy so he asks them to wait. Meanwhile, Mendel explains that his captain had the power to burn down the entire village in an instant, but he wanted to know more about how strong he was. That's why he attacked him from behind, which resulted in him getting burned. Sato starts making origami to help the hostages. Meanwhile, the professor confesses to Sato that he wants to go to Sato's world, as he is fascinated by the idea of technology being shared among everyone. Kirch can no longer bear the weight, but just as she arrives, the professor appears. At that moment, Menville asks the director to inform the queen to stop the invasion of Albion, or else he will kill all the students. However, the professor uses origami to stun everyone. Kirch and Tabitha try to defeat Menville and his men, but he defeats them with a single attack. The professor has to defend them, and Menville recognizes him because those flames belong to the fire serpent. Agnes is left speechless upon hearing this. The professor orders Sato and Louise to help the students escape while he fights Menville. However, Agnes refuses to leave the dining hall since she wants revenge for her burned village and her family. She tries to attack the professor, but Menville tries to kill her to prevent any interruptions between the professor and his fight. He realizes that the professor is trying to protect her, so he uses her as bait, and the professor ends up sacrificing himself for Agnes. Agnes doesn't understand what to do as she notices the same scar on the professor who rescued her as a child. The professor, with his last bit of strength, continues to attack Mendel. Seeing the weak strikes from the professor, Mendel grows overconfident, but the professor strikes him with a powerful attack. Enraged, Mendel tries to retaliate with even greater force. Agnes takes advantage of this and kills him. Afterwards, Agnes wonders why the man who burned her village is the same one who saved her. The professor admits he messed up by burning down the village without checking if there was really a plague. He rushed to save the only surviving girl he heard about. He still wants to save her, even though he thinks Agnes has the right to kill him. 
he asks her not to kill anyone else. After Agnes gets upset and tries to kill him, but Louise stops her because the professor is already dead. Everyone is sad, and Agnes searches through the professor's things. She finds a letter meant for Sado. In the letter, the professor asks Sado not to become a killer, even if he goes to war. Days later, the queen summons Louise to Albion because they plan to invade its capital to avoid civilian casualties. They ask Louise to take charge of their troops using magic, just as she did with the warship. Louise accepts as she wants to please the queen. Sado disagrees because he doesn't want to kill humans, but he accompanies her anyway. Louise tries to cast the spell, but she fails because, according to Durflinger, she used up all the magic she had in Tristane. Louise wants to try again, but the Albion knights spot them, so they try to shoot them down with their dragons. Sado hesitates to kill them, so he only incapacitates them, but this distraction leads to their plane crashing. Sado has to build a shelter in the snow, so he becomes exhausted and nearly freezes to death. Upon seeing him collapse, Louise follows Sado's advice and warns him through direct contact. The next morning, he wakes up refreshed, but Louise doesn't want him to know, so she silences Derflinger. Sheffield learns about Sado's attack and the advancing Tristan troops, so she orders a retreat of her men and all the food from the village, hoping to make their stay in the capital difficult when they arrive. Meanwhile, Sado sees one of the fallen Albion knights and attacks them as soon as he can, but he gets injured and passes out. Louise carries him away because leaving a wounded man to die would bring dishonor to her family. This knight's name is Henry, and as soon as he wakes up, he tries to kill Sado again, but he pushes him away and tells him that he won't kill him. Henry thinks it's a matter of honor, but Sado denies it because he doesn't belong to any royal family, he just wants to live and keep Louise alive. Henry calms down upon hearing this and pretends to be asleep, as he has witnessed Sado and Louise fighting quite a bit. Louise is worried because she doesn't know how to explain her failure in the mission, but Sado only wants her to tell the truth. However, Louise would prefer death over admitting her failure in a mission entrusted to her by the queen herself. Henry is surprised that such a young member of a Tristane family is so honorable, so he introduces himself and doesn't resist them. Henry is amazed by the plane since it's faster than his dragon, which died saving his life. Sado apologizes for what he did, but Henry doesn't see a reason for an apology since they're in a war. Sado disagrees because he doesn't want to, he only wants to protect those he loves. This makes Henry wish he could live that way since others prefer to abandon the people they love for the sake of honor. Sado realizes he's talking about himself and feels silly for wanting to leave the person he loves. Henry gets upset because if Sado plans to leave anyway, he should have called off his marriage. Sado thinks he's the worst because he should want to live no matter what to be with his beloved Louise agrees, believing people should only focus on their final moments. They promise to do everything they can to survive. They hear a gunshot, so they let Henry join them, and he helps by telling them where Sado landed on the other side of the mountain. Meanwhile, Julio is in the area searching for Sado and Louise appears, but they fly off before they get shot. They return to the palace, and Louise apologizes for her failure. She wants to be punished, so she offers to undertake the most dangerous missions they have, which worries Sado because she should try to survive instead of protecting her honor. They manage to reach the capital, but Louise believes that the people of Albion have no honor since they welcome the invaders with open arms. However, Sado sees it differently, not only were they abandoned, but they were also left without food, and Tristan shared their supplies. So, it makes sense for them to be on good terms with Tristan. However, Louise is unconvinced and believes it's a pawn mentality. Louise goes to see the queen and leaves Sado to his own devices. The queen gives another mission, which involves observing Albion's castle to see if they are preparing for a surprise attack. Louise accepts and goes to see Sado, but since they are quarreling, she ends up asking Julio for help, and he gladly agrees. Sado goes to the village and encounters Siesta, who came to help her uncle with his business. However, it turns out her uncle is Scarin. Siesta actually came to find Sado, as she now clearly has an unrequited love for him. Meanwhile, the nobles of Albion consider surrender as an option since they don't have enough soldiers to attack. However, Sheffield spots Julio and Louise riding on his dragon, and they attack them. Julio defends himself and takes down the Albion knights. Meanwhile, Sado is having dinner with Siesta and her family, and Jessica is surprised that Sado has won over her cousin. Sado, on the other hand, is more surprised that both of them have such similarities, although Scarin says it's a common trait. Meanwhile, Louise is upset because Sado has distanced himself from her. Durflinger shows her his perspective, explaining that after she mistreated him, it's normal for him to distance himself. Sado comes from a world where there are no nobles or pawns, so Durflinger recommends that Louise declare her love, since Sado stayed for her but all he received was mistreatment. Louise doesn't like the idea, so Durflinger has the brilliant idea of switching roles so that she can understand Sado better. She dresses up as a cat for Sado, 
but he doesn't come alone, leaving everyone stunned by her appearance. Sato wonders what she wanted to do, and Durflinger tries to explain what happened, but Louise stops him, as she doesn't want to admit that she did it for him. She lies and says she did it to catch Julio's attention, but to her bad luck, Julio shows up, and she runs away to avoid being burned. Siesta then dresses up as a bunny to compete with Louise, which angers her, and she ends up removing Siesta's clothes, leaving her exposed. On the other hand, Sheffield knows how to defeat Tristan's army, so she casts a spell on the village lake and then leaves, leaving the general in charge to continue the war. Returning to Sato, Kurtz believes he saw a fairy who saved his life when he was seriously injured, but no one believes him, thinking it may have been a hallucination. Kirch is convinced of what he saw and also isn't afraid of death, since as a noble, it would be an honor to die in battle. But this annoys Sato because instead of appreciating his life, Kirch only talks about dying for honor. Louise becomes upset because honor is the most important thing for a noble, and all she wants is to serve the queen. She would die if the queen asked her to. Sato gets angry and leaves her to do as she pleases. Durflinger tries to calm him down by telling him the truth, but Siesta catches up to him, thinking she's the reason for his anger, although that's not the case. He takes her to a shelter so she doesn't freeze. Meanwhile, the soldiers drinking from the well fall under a spell that turns them rebellious, and they try to kill the queen. Agnes gives the warning when they attack the headquarters, but it's too late as a fireball hits them, and the queen nearly gets hit. Fortunately, Agnes saves her, but the general is killed in the explosion. Sato wants to help, but Siesta is worried he might risk his life because of Louise, so she gives him a potion that can make Louise fall asleep if she asks him to do something too dangerous. Meanwhile, Louise is attacked by the guards and almost dies if it weren't for Sato, who appears at the last moment to save her. The next day, Agnes explains the reason for the rebels among their troops, and the cardinal asks the queen to retreat since there is an attack from Albion that they won't be able to stop. However, the queen refuses as she wants to ensure the safety of the people. Hours later, Louise informs Sato that she will act as bait to buy time, as the cardinal secretly asked her to do so, giving the queen time to escape. Sato is very worried since it's a dangerous mission, but Louise believes that if she uses void magic, she could stand against Albion's troops. However, Sato has no faith in that plan since it didn't work the last time. Sato becomes upset again and tries to reject the mission, but Louise isn't doing it just for her honor, if the army invades, many people they know will be hurt, so Sato accepts that she should carry out the mission. Sato decides to have a special goodbye moment with Louise by granting her a wish while they're drinking together. Surprisingly, Louise asks him to marry her as her farewell wish. Nervously, Sato agrees, and they start getting ready for the ceremony. They buy flowers from the market and hold the wedding at the church. However, Sato actually doesn't want Louise to carry out the mission. He uses Siesta's potion in her drink, and they begin the ceremony by expressing their true feelings. The more genuine love they show, the more the flowers bloom, and Louise declares her love. But then she faints due to the potion's effects, and a tearful voice of Sato can be heard. Sato tries to take her to a safe place, but Julio, who is spying on them against their wishes, takes Louise. Sato heads off to confront Albion soldiers. He realizes that after hearing Louise express herself so sincerely, he would feel like he's betraying her if he doesn't take action to fulfill her mission. Meanwhile, upon learning that Louise will act as bait, the queen tries to save her, but the cardinal convinces her to stay. Sato fights against the hypnotized soldiers, and Louise wakes up on the ship looking for Sato. However, Julio tells her what he did, and she tries to jump off to fight alongside Sato, but it's too late. Sato makes his way to Albion's army, knowing that he will probably die, but he still goes to fight since he promised Louise. Despite defeating many enemies, they manage to bring him down after numerous spells and attacks, and Louise realizes from the flower they created that Sato's life is about to end. Days later, everyone is depressed due to Sato's apparent death, especially the queen, who blames herself. Alina, acting coldly, tries to console Louise, telling her that it's just the death of a familiar and she shouldn't grieve so much. Louise cries even more, as Sato meant everything to her. She asks to be left alone and looks at the flower, but suddenly Sato comes back to life. She goes running outside the academy and confirms that he's still alive. She runs to hug him and confirm that she's not seeing a ghost. It turns out a fairy saved him and took care of him when he was near death, although he says out loud that this fairy had large talents, which makes Louise jealous. They return to their usual routine, causing explosions everywhere. That's it for this video watch the following video and I'll catch you in the next one.